I remember um, the first I heard of the Duke Cross Massacre was on the Sunday morning, very early, um, 18th of January, 1981. Um, I heard it on the radio. It was horrific. And all the young people being killed and news coming through all the time about uh, rising numbers. And I remember distinctly the police saying that it was a firebomb thrown through the front window of the house on that Sunday. They were saying that. Subsequently, they ran away from that story. But it rang true for a lot of us because there'd been so many racist attacks, including places being bombed out in the preceding years, and including in that part of London. And then later that same Sunday, um, I was a member of the Black Parents Movement and was part of the political alliance of the Black Parents Movement, the Black Youth Movement and the Race to Data Collective. And later on that same Sunday, we were having one of our regular Sunday meetings, which I think, if I remember rightly, started at five o'clock. And when the meeting started, we abandoned our planned agenda and everybody was talking about what had happened at New Cross. And we were all trying to piece together bits of knowledge that we all had. Um, it was the days, of course, again, before social media. So it was all ringing people up with landlines and trying to talk to people we knew. We discovered that Mrs. Ruddock, whose house the party was in, was being looked after by Sybil Phoenix, who was a black um, community worker at the time. So John LaRose decided that we should go down there straight away. And at the time, I had a car, which was a car called a Morris Minor, tiny car. And straight away, we left the meeting, me driving, John LaRose, dark as how. And I think there was one other person, I think it might have been Alex Pascal. We went down to Sybil Phoenix's house in Lewisham. And I'll never forget this, we went through to a bedroom where Mrs. Ruddock was on the bed in a shell-shocked state. And in that room, with her on the bed, and I was in the room, and I probably, John and probably Dark as well as well, Alex Pascal conducted an interview with her about what had happened, which he then broadcast and was used a lot of times on his program, a BBC program at the time called Black Londoners. So that's a really strong memory that I have of the day of the fire. And then in the weeks following that, my memories of being very, very heavily involved in our organisations in leading the New Cross Massacre Action Committee and planning for the Black People's Day of Action. So we had the Black People's Day of Action not that long later, on 2nd of March 1981, but in the weeks after that, it's just a blur of, of meetings, of uh, organisation, planning for the, the, the march, at the same time trying to fight against police inf misinformation. Uh, I remember travelling out of London lots of times after work and going to places like rugby, I think Northampton and other places to rally support for Black People's Day of Action. So the reason why I think the archives are important is so that the next generation have access to good information. Uh, the late John Rose was always insistent about the importance of information to activism and liberation. When we started the George Patmore Institute in 1991, we were very clear that our archive is what we called an activist's archive. That is, a lot of the bedrock of the archive is drawn from the campaigns and battles that we ourselves were involved, one of which was the New Cross Massacre. So I think it's really important that the New Cross Massacre archive is available to the general public, to academics and scholars, and anybody of future generations who want to know what happened, a really good starting place would be to use our New Cross Massacre archive.
I can't remember exactly the circumstances surrounding the hearing the news about the New Cross massacre. I know that I was at home. Um, I can't remember if I heard it first on the radio or on the TV, but I remember getting a call from Darkus on a Sunday evening. Darkus being Darkus Howe, editor of Race Today magazine, published by the Race Today Collective of which I was a member. I got a phone call from Darkus saying that there had been this fire in New Cross and that they suspected that it was a racist arson attack. Sybil Phoenix from the Moonshot had called her friend, Jessica Huntley, um, who was a member of the Black Parents Movement. I was a black member of the Black Parents Movement at the time. And she got in touch with John LaRose, who was also a founding member of the Black Parents Movement. And um, I think the people who first arrived on the scene in New Cross was John LaRose, Roxy Harris, Jessica and Eric Huntley, Darkus Howe and Leela Hassan. My participation in the Black People's Day of Action, I was one of the organizers. I belonged to the, the New Cross Massacre Action Committee, which was formed soon after the fire. The main people in the New Cross Massacre Action Committee were members of the Black Parents Movement, the Race Today Collective, the Black Youth Movement, and the Northern Black Collective. The chairman of the New Cross Massacre Action Committee was John LaRose. I was involved in mobilizing for the Black People's Day of Action. I went to various places to speak about the the fire and what we were doing about it. I remember going to some youth clubs and community centers, attending some meetings at the colleges with Michael LaRose. And I also remember accompanying Darkus Howe on his national mobilization trips to places um, in Yorkshire and further afield. The day of action itself I was one of the stewards, and one of my jobs was to try and keep the rude boys under control, which was virtually impossible. But I think they were fairly well behaved. They played a crucial role when we got to Blackfriars Bridge and the police tried to turn us back. It was the surge forward that broke the police cord and was largely led by the rude boys. The New Cross Massacre Action Committee archives are held by the George Padmore Institute and it's very important because it's the only authentic record that uh, we have outside of stuff from the inquests which the state has. It's the only record, historical record that's available uh, about what happened and the, the documents we have are very important because within 48 hours of the fire, the police had ruled out the possibility of it being a racist arson attack, having in fact told Mrs. Ruddock that it was an arson attack when they arrived on the scene. Without carrying out any forensic investigation, within 48 hours they dismissed the possibility, so we knew from the beginning it was going to be a cover-up. So the New Cross Massacre Action Committee set up a fact-finding committee and statements were taken from those who were at the house. Statements were taken by eyewitnesses. So that record is there and it's of enormous historical importance. I'm Bron Ware, I'm a photographer and writer. And in 1981, I worked for Searchlight magazine, which is an anti-fascist, anti-racist journal that's still going. Comes out every month. And at that time, I was working with Maurice Ludmer, who was a very um, intrepid and important journalist and trade unionist, a deeply anti-racist as well as anti-fascist. I want to say something about the GPI archives, which are part of the way I've been able to understand some of the better, some of the photographs I took at the time. So 1981 we covered on a monthly basis 
incidents of uh, racist violence and harassment that took place, whether due to the police or far-right groups or random racist attacks. So when the fire happened in January 1981, while this was not a surprise, the tragedy was, uh, was deeply shocking, of course, but we knew that there had been petrol bombs through people's letterboxes, fire bombs and arson attacks on people's homes. So we understood too well how people felt this might have been an attack caused by the National Front in South London. We also knew because we monitored police racism and stop and search, the sus laws and so on, we also understood how frustrated and angry people felt at the lack of interest shown by the police in investigating this terrible crime. So I came to the march as a reporter in some ways, but predominantly, mainly, I came out of solidarity with friends, came down, this was a national mobilisation, and I came to take part. So with my two cameras, I dodged in and out, taking pictures and then coming back with my friends and being part of the march, then taking more pictures. So I was able to both absorb the feeling of the march as well as to try and record it. The main thing I think I remember, apart from walking up through past the, f the house itself in New Cross, was what happened when we got to Blackfriars Bridge and the police tried to stop us. I have lots of pictures of the police in riot shields trying to block the way. And then walking through Fleet Street, which was actually quite exhilarating, being able to kind of talk back to the journalists and newspaper people, because of course they were all housed there, the Express, The Telegraph and so on. All the newspapers were there. And they were part of the problem at that time, the way in which black people were represented, the way that racism was played down and always denied. This was part of the problem. And my pictures at that point, again, are quite sort of blurry and quite, um, some of them are quite indistinct. But to me, they summon up that memory of people being able to walk abreast the, across the road, uh, the police no longer trying to stop the crowd from walking forward. Hundreds of people, anti-racist and black people, walking along and being able to somehow assert their right to be there, assert their right to, pre to protest against the institution of the press. So the years went by, I had all these negatives stored away, and then at a certain point when it was possible to scan them, I decided it was really important to put them in some kind of archive. And at that time, I went to autograph ABP, which is a, um, a, an archive of black cultural and anti-racist photography, and they were happy to, to, to have everything scanned and to help me choose which pictures would be good to exhibit. In 2017, Les Back, my friend at, uh, and collaborator at Goldsmiths, curated an exhibition at Goldsmiths where we, where we displayed, I think, 21 of the pictures. And we supplemented this with examples of press coverage from the day and also materials from the New Cross Massacre Action Committee. We felt it was very important to provide a deeper context and not just show the pictures on their own. Of course, we couldn't have done this without the GPI. So what I really want to say is how fantastic a resource this is, how it deserves to be much better known, and because for teachers, for activists, for historians, whoever who wants to have some feel of the history, particularly around this time of the early 1980s, it's an incredibly useful resource. And as I say, the pictures are one thing, but without the other kinds of material, the leaflets, and the minutes of meetings and other evidence of organisation at that time against racism, then we would be much poorer. I was only about 12 years old at the time of the New Cross fire. I vaguely remember hearing about it. It was on the news and stuff. However, the subsequent Brixton riots and the Black People's Day of Action was a talk of the school. It wasn't until I was older that the horrific nature of everything surrounding the New Cross fire became known to me. One of the things I wanted to do as a playwright was to document Black British history. I was tired of Black British history being told to us by those who I believe hadn't earned the right to write it. 
So my first play was about the New Cross fire. The play, Lover's Rock, was first commissioned by Soho Theatre in 2006, but unfortunately they passed on it, so I brought it to the Albany Theatre. They were keen to have it produced for the 30th anniversary of the New Cross fire in 2011. But as I continued my research, and as I began to work closely with the families, especially George and Velvetina Francis, whose son Jerry died in the fire, it became clear that the draft I had written didn't do the subject matter justice. And moreover, I hadn't earned the right to write it. Still, I believed it was important to have an event in order for one generation to remember and reflect, and another to be introduced and educated. So I organised the event Remembering the New Cross Fire 30 years on, with the help of my wife, Nisha Bano, who wrote an article in The Voice about the event, and Yvette Griffith, who took care of the publicity. We organised the event from our kitchen table, the event, held at the Albany Theatre, was an inspiring evening. It was hosted by Kwame Kweama, and it featured poetry and readings from El Crisis, Kochi Newland, Zena Edwards, and it featured discussion and remembrances from Gus John, Menelik Shabazz, and Alec Pascal. And the evening was rounded off by a concert from the Queens of Lover's Rock, Janet Kay and Carol Thompson. All profits went to two local charities. And a few years after the event, I rewrote the play and it was broadcast on BBC Radio 3. While I was researching Lover's Rock, I went to libraries such as the British Library for information. I wasn't strictly doing a documentary. I was writing drama. But I wanted to find as much information as possible about the events surrounding the New Cross fire to add to my existing knowledge. However, I was dismayed to find out that black British history at that time was not adequately recorded. That was until my wife put me in touch with Sarah White at the GPI archive. It was there that I found that black British history was not only categorized, but catalogued. I can remember it as clear as if it were yesterday, going through newspaper clippings of the New Cross fire in chronological order. I was able to piece together what happened when it happened and more importantly what people felt at the time, which meant I could dramatically build up a picture of the events of the New Cross fire, which could aid my dramatic version of events. The GPI was extremely important in the writing of my play Lover's Rock, and since then, the GPI have been my first port of call when I'm writing historical plays. The collection is important because if we don't record catalogue and categorise our history, black British history, it will be lost. There are other archives, but none I believe as extensive, and none I believe where it is apparent that the staff care about what they are preserving. It is important so that the new generations of artists, academics and students will make the past part of their future. I'm Jay Bernard and I've been thinking about and working with um, and talking about the New Cross Fire since 2016 when I did a residency at the George Padmore Institute. Um, the, the whole idea was of course speaking volumes and I was really excited to do it. I think it's probably one of the best things I've ever done in terms of a kind of true engagement with history and this kind of area that I'm from, this kind of like South London history, local history. You know, I'm always going to be a South Londoner and the New Cross Fire is a kind of irremovable, inexorable part of that heritage. In terms of what I knew about the New Cross Fire before I started going into the archives, the truth is I didn't really know anything. I had absorbed a few bits of information just because of having watched Blood of Garun at the Media Tech at the British Film Institute when I was a teenager. But there was something about it that didn't quite sink in. I, I didn't quite understand the gravity of the case and why it was such an important bit of history and what it precipitated. So when I went into the archives, that was actually my first time truly engaging with the story. 
because these stories are so much more complex and complicated and strange than than it would seem and that's because there's a lot of people involved there's a lot of personal history involved there's a lot of contradictions and backtracking and clashing stories you know from everybody as well as the police um so it's safe to say that when i first went into the archives i really didn't know anything about the new cross fire i really didn't and um and now I, I still feel like I don't know anything about it, despite reading about it, thinking about it. Um, I still think it's one of the most alluring parts of black British history, British history in general, because it is unresolved. So I, I went into the archives uh, as a poet, not as a historian, not as a um, academic researcher, not as a journalist, I was trying to enter into it as someone who was um, looking at some boxes of material and relating to it kind of human to human. That's That was my approach. I didn't feel like I was in the right place or the right position in myself anyway to try and create something that was a historical document, so to speak, or that was somehow um, going to set the record straight or going to come at it from a, a very particular position. That just is, wasn't my place. I really learned about the place of a writer, the ethics, um, and what it takes, actually, to um, produce the kind of um, reportage or the kind of, like, history. And that, that, that isn't me. I called and no one seemed to call with me and no one seemed to know or see what I had seen. I was so sickened and so grieved. And I said to the child I knew harboured in the fire, jump Yvonne, jump, pull, jump. I said I called, jump Yvonne, jump, pull, jump. My voice, it was so weak. Pull, jump. So sickened and so grieved. I want to get to some of the emotional truth of the story. And I want to get at some of the emotional truth of what it means to be looking at these boxes now you know, 40 years later. We've just had uh, the 40th anniversary, of course, um, on January 18th. Um, and then also what it means to be carrying this history inside my particular body and experience, you know. Working with the archives at the George Pamela Institute um, and working with this story of the New Cross Fire has had a big impact on me. I think there's a there's sort of two sides to it there's a, there's the practical side of it's my first debut collection and it's been really interesting to see how people have responded to this story like how people have you know said to me that they never heard of it or maybe they um lived through it and then they were like oh i was at the march and you know i remember this and i think what it's highlighted to me is the the tricky and messy transmission of history that is marginalised or that is not deemed important um, and how hard it actually is to transmit that to the next generation. It made me think a lot about that, how we can move beyond the media as our principal way of receiving information or what we call news, because um, a lot of the time it's not news as such, it's very calculated and very controlled. On a personal level, working with the New Cross Fire is really, um, I think you've got to go to a particular kind of place if you're gonna sit with that kind of material for a really long time um, and think about it and make art based around it. And now I've done a book and a show and I've made a film. I think I've become more, even more convinced that history and politics even um, really exist in the grey zone and that I'm, I'm more willing to occupy that zone because I think sometimes it's so easy to fall into a, a very um, hard line position and the facts don't always support that. And I'm not saying obviously, you know, people were fighting you know, for their lives, people were fighting against horrendous racism, you know, people being burned out of their homes, all kinds of terrible things. But I think how that story is told and what it is we focus on, I, I think I've become a lot more sensitive to that kind of stuff now.